Your community, your opinions, your forum. This is your talk show on News Radio 1230 WCLO. The opinions expressed by your talk show host do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the station or Bliss Communications. The open line phone number is 752 4000. Please remember that all calls will be live on the air. Now, here's the host of your talk show, Tim Bremel. Welcome to the program. I believe that this may be the most unique hour we've done since we've been together here. I hope it is. Um, Let me start by giving you just a little bit of background. As many of you know, uh, I, in addition to my responsibilities here at the uh, radio stations in Janesville, uh, do uh, a little segment for a periodical that's distributed around the Midwest called Midwest Today, and they do a little radio program, and I uh, have been voicing that segment for a number of years, and uh, my uh, boss over there, for lack of a better term, I guess, Larry, my good friend Larry, um, emailed me earlier this month and said, we need to do something for Christmas this year. It's the 18th anniversary of the show. What what can we do? Um uh, we're departing from some of the things we've normally done, and, and if you got any ideas, send them my way. Uh, well, when I need ideas, I did what I always do, and I, and I jumped online, and I, I used my Google search, and I typed in, thinking that was Christmas, I, I needed something that was Midwestern-oriented and uh, something that would be a, a good story for Christmas, and I typed in uh, Midwest Christmas Miracle. And among the story, you know, I'm looking for something now that has a Midwestern focus, and all of a sudden, uh, the words Mayfair Mall caught my eye. If it was the Mayfair Mall, I knew, and sure enough, it was the Mayfair Mall in Wauwatosa. And so as I started going through the process, I uh, came across a story uh, that has been posted on Facebook. And it um, has been going viral, for lack of a better term. It turns out that the story is one of these that lives on. In fact, if you snopes it these days, it is uh, recorded as legend, not as fact. Uh, snopes may wish to change that at some point, although there are some pieces to a puzzle missing if you're going with pure journalistic integrity. But isn't that the way most miracles tend to unfold? That they're a matter of faith and they're a matter of your belief. And that, I think, is what we have uh, all been drawn into, you through me, through our two guests who we will speak with uh, just briefly. But let me welcome them to, them to the program because they are here with us on the phone. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Lisa Christensen. Are you there? I am. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Lisa is uh, uh, responsible for having basically uh, breathed new life into this story in a post on your social media pages, which have uh, thousands of followers. Thank you, yes. And, and, uh, and we are also uh, very honored to have with us the, uh, the writer of the story and uh, the Santa Claus, who you will hear about in moments, uh, who the story actually happened to. That would be uh, Mark and Susan Leonard, who are on the other line with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you both for joining us as well. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a little more detail, but I think first we need to bring everybody out there in the listening audience up to speed on the story that happened. Uh, Mark, I know that uh, this is a true story. It comes from you. You told it to your family and your acquaintances, and, and eventually your wife wrote it down. But, uh, Mark, you have already heard what we're about to hear, and I need to ask you before we play it for the audience— Does this accurately portray the situation that you found yourself involved in some uh, 18 years ago? Yes, it does. I really appreciate what you guys did. All right. Well, that being said, we're going to put you guys back on hold. You'll be able to hear this. And uh, to the folks in the audience, here is, I think, a great Midwestern Christmas miracle. 
In December of 1997, a little boy and his grandmother came to see Santa at the Mayfair Mall in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, near Milwaukee. The child climbed up on Santa's lap holding a picture of a little girl. Who is this? asked Santa, smiling. Your friend? Your sister? Yes, Santa, he replied. My sister Sarah. She's very sick, he said sadly. Santa glanced over at the grandmother who was waiting nearby and saw her dabbing her eyes with a tissue. She wanted to come with me to see you. Oh, so very much, Santa, the child exclaimed. She misses you, he added softly. Santa tried to be cheerful and encouraged a smile to the boy's face, asking him what he wanted Santa to bring him for Christmas. When they finished their visit, the grandmother came over to help the child off his lap, started to say something, and then halted. What is it? Santa asked warmly. Well, well, I know it's really too much to ask you, Santa, but, the old woman began, shooing her grandson over to one of Santa's elves to collect the little gift which Santa gave all his young visitors. The girl in the photograph, my granddaughter? Well, you see, she has leukemia and isn't expected to make it even through the holidays, she said through tear-filled eyes. Is there any way, Santa, any possible way that you could come and see Sarah? That's all she asked for for Christmas, is, is to see Santa. Santa blinked and swallowed hard, told the woman to leave information with his elves as to where Sarah was, and he'd see what he could do. Santa thought of little else the rest of that afternoon. He knew what he had to do. What if it were my child lying in that hospital bed dying, he thought with a sinking heart? This is the least I can do. When Santa finished visiting with all the boys and girls that evening, he retrieved from his helper the name of the hospital where Sarah was staying. He asked the assistant location manager how to get to Children's Hospital. Why, Rick asked with a puzzled look on his face. Santa relayed to him the conversation with Sarah's grandmother earlier that day. Come on, I'll take you there, Rick said softly. Rick drove them to the hospital and came inside with Santa. They found out which room Sarah was in, and Rick said he'd wait out in the hall. Santa quietly peeked into the room through the half-closed door and saw little Sarah on the bed. The room was full of what appeared to be her family. There was the grandmother and the girl's brother he had met earlier that day. A woman who he guessed was Sarah's mother stood by the bed, gently pushing Sarah's thin hair off her forehead. And another woman, who he discovered later was Sarah's aunt, sat in a chair near the bed with a weary, sad look on her face. They were talking quietly, and Santa could sense the warmth and closeness of the family and their love and concern for Sarah. Taking a deep breath and forcing a smile on his face, Santa entered the room, bellowing a hearty, Ho, 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 ho! Santa, shrieked little Sarah weakly as she tried to escape her bed to run to him, IV tubes still intact. Santa rushed to her side and gave her a warm hug. A child the tender age of his own son, nine years old, gazed up at him with wonder and excitement. Her skin was pale and her short tresses bore telltale bald patches from the effects of chemotherapy but all he saw when he looked at her was a pair of huge blue eyes and his heart melted. He had to force himself to choke back the tears, and though his eyes were riveted upon Sarah's face, he could hear the gasps and quiet sobbing of the women in the room. As he and Sarah began talking, the family crept quietly to the bedside one by one, squeezing Santa's shoulder or his hand, gratefully whispering thank you as they gazed sincerely at him with shining eyes. Santa and Sarah talked and talked, and she told him excitedly all the toys she wanted for Christmas, assuring him she'd been a very good girl that year. As their time dwindled, Santa felt led in his spirit to pray for Sarah and asked for permission from the girl's mother. She nodded in agreement, and the entire family circled around Sarah's bed holding hands. Santa looked intently at Sarah and asked her if she believed in angels. Oh, yes, Santa, I do, she exclaimed. Well, I'm going to ask that angels watch over you, he said. Laying one hand on the child's head, Santa closed his eyes and prayed. He asked that God touch little Sarah and heal her body from this disease. He asked that angels minister to her, watch and keep her. And when he finished praying, still with eyes closed, he started softly singing, Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. The family joined in, still holding hands, smiling at Sarah and crying tears of hope and tears of joy for this moment as Sarah beamed at them all. When the song ended, Santa sat at the end of the bed and again held Sarah's small, frail hands in his own. Now, Sarah, he said authoritatively, you have a job to do, and that's to concentrate on getting well. I want you to have fun playing with your friends this summer, 
and I expect to see you at my house at Mayfair Mall this time next year. He knew it was risky proclaiming that to this little girl who had terminal cancer, but he had to. He had to give her the greatest gift he could give, not dolls or games or toys, but the gift of hope. Yes, Santa Sarah exclaimed, her eyes bright. He leaned down, kissed her on her forehead, and left the room. Out in the hall, the minute Santa's eyes met Rick's, a look passed between them, and they wept unashamed. Sarah's mother and grandmother slipped out of the room quickly and rushed to Santa's side to thank him. My only child is the same age as Sarah, he explained quietly. This is the least I could do. They nodded with understanding and hugged him. One year later, Santa Mark was again back in the set in Milwaukee for his six-week seasonal job, which he so loves to do. Several weeks went by, and then one day, a child came up to sit on his lap. Hi, Santa, remember me? Of course I do, Santa proclaimed, as he always does, smiling down at her after all. The secret to being a good Santa is to always make each child feel as if they're the only child in the world at that moment. You came to see me in the hospital last year. Santa's jaw dropped. Tears immediately sprang in his eyes, and he grabbed this little miracle and held her to his chest. Sarah, he exclaimed. He scarcely recognized her, for her hair was long and silky, and her cheeks were rosy, much different from the little girl he had visited just a year before. He looked over and saw Sarah's mother and grandmother in the sidelines, smiling and waving and wiping their eyes. That was the best Christmas ever for Santa Claus. He had witnessed and been blessed to be the instrument in bringing about this miracle of hope. This precious little child was healed, cancer-free, alive and well. He silently looked up to heaven and humbly whispered, Thank you, Father. Tis a very Merry Christmas. Joining us on the phone from, I, I believe it's Georgia, is that correct, Santa Mark? Yes. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you. Um, this happened a long time ago, really, in in, in our world here, 1997. Um, Mayfair Mall, I, I know it well. I've been there several times, uh, not uh, more than about an hour from where we're broadcasting from right now here in Janesville. And uh, you had been uh, a Santa Claus there for a number of years. Is that right? Yes, sir. I've been there since uh, from 1994 to 1999. Uh, and uh, you're you're part of a crew that is a, a real bearded Santa. So you have a an authentic white beard. You don't have to costume that part of the costume. That's correct. Um, I was hired as a natural bearded Santa. And actually, I, if I can interject, it's kind of neat that um, when this happened in 1997. Mark was much younger, of course, and he didn't have a natural white beard, so he would grow his beard out and then sit two days in a hairdresser's chair getting bleached out from <laughs> through shades of yellow and red to a beautiful platinum white and then have to have arrange for touch-ups during the six weeks that he was on set. <laughs> but it aged him overnight 20 years with his eyebrows bleached and the whole shebang and his hair. So uh, now he's much, much more gray. He's almost white naturally now and as he's heading to the age of 60. But uh, they're still called natural bearded Santas. Um, and he was naturally bearded and it was uh, bleached white. All right. And this is, this is Susan Leonard, by the way, folks, uh, listening in. This is uh, Mark's wife. And Susan actually authored the story and, and, and put it into print uh, a couple of years after this happened. Uh, Mark, in, in your role as Santa Claus, uh, you are obviously, from the story, also a man of faith, and I know a lot of people kind of question that mix. They they are often viewed as the antithesis of each other. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit? Well, my, my faith is based on my belief that, that Jesus is the reason for the season, not Santa Claus, not packages and getting the, the greatest gift that we were getting, which was God's Son. And I believe that he used me in this story as uh, a vessel through which the Holy Spirit can operate in this physical realm. 
that is the part of the story that is is the miracle part. And as I yeah. understand it, Mark, and you're going to have to fill in some of the gaps for me because while we've been uh, chatting back and forth over email here, um, I've gotten some of the picture. Um, it it appeared to me that while uh, miraculous and while you knew uh, the, that uh, the Holy Spirit was at work here and, and God healed this little girl, uh, the skeptics came out of the woodwork and began to criticize the story and, and question your motivation for even telling it, correct? Yes. Um, in the beginning, we had put it together so that we could share it with family and friends. And then later on, um, my wife put it out there for people to read, and it just evidently just went viral. And this was back, uh, Susan, when you published this, this was in uh, 2007 when it first appeared on your blog, right? Or 2000, 2000 when it first appeared on your blog. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, I originally put it on GeoCities, but as you probably know, GeoCities uh, stopped allowing web pages uh, in the U.S. And so I had to move it somewhere else, and I, put it, I started it on my own personal blog and put it there. And as far as the question about the skeptics, Mark and I have been answering those along with Lisa Christensen on her um, fan page. Um, the skeptics have really been very hurtful, <laughs> and Mark had to just literally take a step back from it all because that part was really overwhelming. But, you know, the thing is is that you've got to realize back in 1997, we had no cell phones. We had no, there was no such thing as social media. It wasn't like we could snap a picture with our smartphone and say, and, and then rush to, you know, Twitter or Facebook or whatever, whatever, Instagram and say, oh, look what just happened. This is this cool. You know, it, it wasn't that era. So the story evolved through the way that, that we have explained it. Because I am, I have a journalism degree in um, news editorial sequence. So, as you can imagine, it's fact, fact, fact. I was a reporter and editor and so forth. So, it, it actually, it's kind of hard for me to write in a uh, creative sense. So, this writing this was a challenge. So, of course, I always had to go fact, go to source, get the quote, etc. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Uh, we lost touch with, with uh, you know, little Sarah. I couldn't provide that documentation as much as I would have loved to to, to Snopes because people in Lisa's thread have really quoted Snopes says it's legend, so it's not true. Well, you know, Snopes isn't the ultimate authority of truth. God is. And they had to, as you said, mark it as legend because there weren't enough facts. And, and there wasn't, you know, a little Sarah to corroborate the story. So, yeah, it's been hard with the skeptics. But, you know, Lisa and Mark and I are just praying that those skeptics be touched, that the scales be removed from their eyes, that their heart be softened, and through this story or somehow through contact with all three of us, that they will be led to the Lord. Well, th that's my hope as well. And and Mark, I, I I have not met you, and I, and we only spoke briefly this morning for the very first time. Yes. I could not, however, help but have my heart nearly break. Um, when when I was confronted with the information that said you you know you gave of your time in such a way and and you played Santa Claus and you brought joy to so many kids and I'm certain that you prayed for them all as well and to have this experience come into your life and and then have so much negativity come out surrounding it that it must have almost made you question whether you should even relate and tell the story nearly broke my heart and i cannot tell you sir how overjoyed i was when after considering this and praying on it you decided to join us on the program this morning and and i am hopeful that uh, you are met this time around with much more positive response to your continuing to tell this story well i i pray it will be um thank you for that i um it's it's not about me it's I'm, I'm, I'm no saint by any measure, um, but it, it's all about God's power and the fact that I believe firmly that children, 
should not have to suffer such a devastating disease that no one should, for that matter. And um, I just felt such a, when I look into her beautiful blue eyes, I felt such a, a sense of compassion and, and love for her that I, I never had experienced before. Um, and I felt like with, you know, the fact that she and my son were about the same age, that, you know, if it had been my son in that place uh, in the hospital bed, it was, I, I would expect nothing less from Santa. And that's how I felt about it. Well, it's it was it was certainly uh, a man trying to do the the right thing, even though there was you know when when a child is laying in a hospital with cancer, there is no right thing. You you just do what love can pour out of your heart, and um, a lot of people would find it amazing that a department store Santa would take the time to do that in the first place, uh, let alone what unfolded. Now, I I have to believe, Mark, that that following year, um, though we tell it in the story. When you came to the realization that the girl sitting on your lap was this girl you visited in the hospital the year before, try and relate to us what went on inside of you. Oh, wow. Uh, You've got him crying again, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just shocked at first. Um, It was just so such a, a relief that she was alive, and um, I was just amazed at, at the fact that that God healed her. I mean, when I spoke to the grandmother after the kids got off my lap and went to go visit with uh, some of the staff, she had told me that um, they had just gotten through with her her last checkup. And um, the, the doctor was scratching his head, and he said, I just don't understand it. He said, she wasn't expected to make it through the holidays last year, and yet here she is, vibrant and alive and healthy, and, and they couldn't find a single trace of the disease in her body. And that really made me, it just cemented the whole thing for me, that God is still in the the business of creating miracles. And one thing that Mark told me this morning, I had him scratching his head, which follows up on what you just said, is that the grandmother had told him, um, <clears throat> tell him what the grandmother when, did. When I spoke, this is one part, the first time, <coughs> this is not something that's in the story, mm -hmm. but leading up to her asking me to come and visit was the fact that she had told me that um, they had been to nearly every Santa in Milwaukee area that they could find and to ask them if they would be willing to uh, come and visit. And to their dismay, none of them wanted to or would. And so she said that I was their last hope, and she was really hoping that I would be willing to do it. And I said, well, I... I don't know that if I can, but I said I will do what I can for you. It's, again, proof positive that, that God's plan, we don't know it. And I think that's what's frustrating to most people. Um, and, and I am always uh, encouraged and delighted when I seem to think that I've been able to be given a little sliver of what my purpose might be. Uh, don't know it all. We'll never know it all until I, until I reach the end of this life. Um, but what I'm seeing unfolding with this story um, is just exactly one of those moments. And, and I'm so appreciative, Amen. Mark, of, of, of you, your willingness to, to continue to share the story. You know, when we talk about the Christmas story, and it's the story that's shared every year, and uh, it's it's one of the few stories that people seem willing to still share about the Bible these days. Um, the reality is there are a lot more stories that show a, a loving God out there um, that that these days people are more and more afraid to talk about. And and I appreciate your courage in joining us. Um, I, I'm going to keep you guys on the on the line, Susan and Mark. 
Um, but I'm going to take a commercial break because I have to. And I'm going to come back and we're going to finally get Lisa in here, who, again, sort of by accident or by divine intervention, you guys decide, uh, breathe new life into this story and has brought it to us today. So we'll take a break and we will come right back on your talk show on WCLO. Discover great Christmas gift ideas at Blaine's Farm and Fleet. There's only a few days left to shop, so stop in and find the perfect gift for everyone on your list. For the handyman, save $50 on the DeWalt 20-Volt Max Compact Drill Driver Kit, now just $99. Walk the aisles of Toyland and save up to 70% on select toys while supplies last. Save up to 50% on select holiday decor, tree trimming, gift wrap items, and bakeware. For a little family fun, check out the Triumph Sports air-powered hot Hockey table now just one seventy nine ninety nine. That's a hundred and twenty dollars off the regular price. Try these on for size: boys' champion full zip hooded sweatshirt only thirteen forty nine. Women's booty slippers are just nineteen ninety nine. For the hard to shop for on your list, you just can't go wrong with a Blaine's Farm and Fleet gift card. And remember to keep your shopping adventures hassle free. Order online and pick up in the store. It's easy, convenient, and free. Merry Christmas from your friends at Blaine's Farm and Fleet. What if you could get the very best food from all around the country with the guaranteed lowest prices? Oh, and what if it's all shipped directly to your door absolutely free? Well, rejoice, food lovers. DirectEats.com is here. Direct Eats gives us every consumer the freedom to find the best food at the best prices based on their diet, taste, or needs. That's because at DirectEats.com, the whole country is your supermarket. There's no membership fee, so give it a try. Just go to directeats.com and place your order today. Directeats.com is the largest online natural and organic superstore. From locally made barbecue sauces to an array of nut-free, paleo, gluten-free, or anything and everything in between, the options go on and on. At Direct Eats, they have over 20,000 food products at the guaranteed lowest prices, and they ship them absolutely free right to your door. There's no membership fee. So why not get started on your next food adventure? Stop by directeats.com today. That's directeats.com. If people who do not drive a car are no better off than people who cannot drive a car, and people who do not read are no better off than people who cannot read, then people who do not read the Janesville Gazette, well, you get the point. People who do read the Gazette become informed, enlightened, up to speed with what's up in our local community. So make the choice to be better informed about news, sports, pop culture, your neighbors, you name it. It's in your paper, the Janesville Gazette. Call to subscribe or grab a copy at newsstands everywhere. From our family to yours. Ho, 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 happy holidays. News Radio 1230, WCLO, Janesville, Beloit. Welcome back to your talk show, uh, visiting with uh, Susan and Mark Leonard. Susan, the author of the story that we played for you earlier, and uh, Mark, the Santa Claus. Mark, do you still play Santa Claus, or have you retired? Um, well, no, frankly, I'm, I'm disabled and uh, am not able to do it. So those days, those days behind you, and yet the story lives on. The story... Um, I think, Susan, I don't know how, if you'd agree with my terminology here, but sort of languished out there after you put it up in uh, 2000. Got some initial comments. It uh, went as viral as it could in those days, I guess, um, and and turned out to be a source of discouragement for a while for your husband and yourself, uh, just in that uh, there are so many people that, that need to hear what the story has to offer to people. And um, suddenly, it is a, a story that has been reignited uh, through someone that you didn't even know until recently, correct? Exactly. And I cannot tell you how God has moved in Lisa Christensen being a part of our lives now and the relationship that Lisa and I have fostered in this short week, week and a half, is just another extension of God's miracle, because 
I love her as a sister now, and we have spent some wonderful time together, and I knew with the authentic person that she is and her precious heart and being such an instrumental part of furthering this story, we had to have her here on the show. All right, I believe it was uh, December 7th that Dr. Lisa Christensen posted this, and uh, I'll let you explain the doctor in front of your name, Lisa, but uh, you're a... uh, you're a force of positivity, unlike many I've seen across the Internet. Uh, you, you inspire people. You've inspired celebrities. Uh, I noted on your website uh, with the great enthusiasm, uh, people like the likes of uh, Patrick Dempsey and uh, many other uh, athletes and uh, stars and people that you would think don't need positive encouragement, but they do as well. <laughs> Welcome to the program, Dr. Lisa Christensen. Thank you very much. And I have to first really thank Susan and Mark for sharing this glorious story with me. It, I'm just deeply humbled. I, there are not even words that exist to, to express my, my humble gratitude for this. And it, 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 it's, it's such an exciting journey for us. And I have to thank Emily uh, Holmberg, I believe is her last name, who pointed out who the author was. And I'm just really excited to be a part of this, and thank you, Tim. The uh, the interesting part about this, if uh, if you're inclined to believe in miracles, or maybe you're a skeptic out there, but you need a little more evidence, uh, is in that story. You found you stumbled mm-hmm. across the story, much like I did, I guess, uh, in some ways. Um, and no, you, I I'm, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. No, I didn't uh, mean to interrupt. I'm not, <laughs> That's fine. But in that you did not know the authors, you just looked at the story and you went, you know, this is a a great story with a positive message that can inspire people and give them a little bit of hope. And 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 you put it up uh, without even knowing really where it was from, correct? Yeah, it's kind of funny how it came to me, actually. It, uh, it wasn't every Christmas. I always find some story that speaks to me and I don't. I, I don't have any set timeline that I put it up. I wait until, it's what I call, I wait until God puts it in my lap. And I, I'll know when it's right, and I'll know when it's the one. And I'll put it up. And every year I put up a feel-good, happy, some kind of story. And David, who is uh, a permanent fixture in our family, I, I was raised uh, in Tahlequah, which is a little tiny town on dirt floors. I spoke Cherokee until I was 10, and to kind of introduce who David is, he dated my mother when I was a little girl, and he does speak English, so he's instrumental in my learning how to speak English and furthering my education and so forth. Anyway, David had gone to the library. He loves to do that. He comes over, and he said, uh, hey, have you put up a Christmas post yet? And I said, no, not yet. He says, I think I've got just the one. You're going to love it. It's a tearjerker. I mean, you're really going to love it. And I said, yeah, okay. And I said, yeah, when I get to it. And I said, Can you just, um, you know, and he comes back in and he said, no, seriously. And he said, uh, I, I was at the library and I, he always carries stuff from work uh, to the library. And so in his work papers, he said, I stumbled across this story that somebody gave me some years ago. And, um, well, anyway, I really think you should read it. I mean, if you don't want it, just tell me, but I really think you should read it. And so I finally get around to reading it. I sat down and I I end up telling him, I said, oh, my God, this is perfect. This is, this is the one. And so on December 7th, I sat down, and I put it up there, and I found a picture that, you know, just of a Santa and a little girl. You know, just, I, I Googled Santa with a little girl mm-hmm. and found a picture to put with it, and I posted it. And I really didn't expect this. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I just thought it was going to be another feel-good post like every Christmas. And I don't remember the exact day, but it wasn't very much longer. A a woman, uh, Emily Holmberg, I believe, uh, she writes me a private message. She's so kind. And she wrote me a private message, and she said, I'm sure you don't know who the author is. And she said, but I actually went to school with the author, and it's actually a true story, and, and, and. And went on to go into more detail with it. And so then I went ahead and I corrected it. And I, you know, I put that it was written by Susan Martin Leonard and it was a true story and so on and so forth. And so I amended it. Well, shortly after that, who would have thought that this would just, I mean, like you said, it just went, for lack of a better word, viral. Mm -hmm. And we got hit with everything from good to bad to in between. We've had some pretty, um, 
uplifting posts, you know, beautiful, you know, God-loving, God-fearing posts, all the way to some very blasphemous images. I mean, we there, there's actually a post of an image of a guy with, he's got like a, a physician, he looks like a doctor, and he's got his middle finger up, and, he, and it's just, it's very graphic. And at first, I was going to take it down, because I had seen like several people were like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And I, at first, I was really strongly considering taking it down, and God spoke to me and said, no, leave it there. Leave it there. And so I just addressed it, and I left it there. And, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where I know that a lot of people, and i got to thank Susan. <laughs> she gave me a nice compliment about pretty much this, because when I left it there, I had written a post, something along the lines of, let's, let's prove them wrong, because everybody believes that Christians are hypocrites, and if you don't believe our way, it's no way, and, and, and you know, all the different things mm-hmm. that people believe. You know, they think that, you know, it, it, that Christians are, you know, hateful and judgmental and so on and so forth. And so I had pretty much written something along the lines of, um, you know, I'm not here to judge. That's God's job. I'm not going to judge. I'm just going to love you through it. Because I really don't want for people's anger towards Christians to turn into anger towards Christ. And I don't want people to judge Christ by the behavior and actions of Christians. And so I, I literally, there was one woman who is a Christian who wrote, oh, you know, that's shameful and, you know, whatever. And, you know, I forget exactly what her words were, but basically uh, you're going to go to hell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's not right. <laughs> that's, that's doing exactly what we don't want to do. So I addressed her and I wrote, um, you know, we don't know that because we don't know how much this person who posted this is going to change between now and the time that they depart this earth. We just don't know. We don't know what's, what's in store for them. And so I've left everything up. And a little post that was simply meant to be a Christmas post has reached over 50 million people. It's got over 200,000 likes, and it has over 100,000 comments collectively of all the different pages that it's been posted on. And it is just amazing. It is completely God moving this, and he is moving it in ways. And, you know, before we got on the program today, that was one of the things that I prayed, was that God moved this story in ways to bring more people to him. And as much as I appreciate the positive comments, I appreciate the negative ones, too, because this is the way I look at it. If somebody is posting something negative, I welcome it, because when they're posting something negative, they're posting. And it means to me, at least, and I might just, you know, be in my little crazy Lisa's fantasy world here, but (laughs) to me what that means is they're looking for something more. They're looking for someone to tip the scale to prove to them that God is real. They're looking for someone to say that one thing that's going to trigger them to bring them back to God. What I've come to discover is people that are atheists or agnostic at one time were Christians, and they can probably tell you more about the Bible than me. They've probably read it front to back to sideways, and they've got every argument there is. But they're looking for something to tip it over, to bring them back to God, or they wouldn't be there. Why argue? I mean, if you really believe that, why argue? They're arguing because they want somebody to reach out and grab a hold of them, take them by the hand, and bring them back. And their anger isn't anger. It's just, it's misdirected. It's something that... You know, other people are seeing his anger, and to me, I see that it's just misdirected. It's a misdirected emotion, and they're looking for that something that's going to bring them back. And it's just, but that's how I discovered it was through David, and it, I, and I have to thank David for <laughs> bringing it to my attention because I I had never seen the post or, or heard of it or anything, and now, like Susan said, I mean, you know, we communicate daily, and I absolutely love her with such a deep appreciation as my sister in Christ, as my friend. I just am very grateful for her. And she, between the two of us, have been uh, doing everything we can to find the right word to, to help guide people through their anger and their frustration on the post. And she's had to go in because we've had some people who have even gone so far as to say, oh, but the picture of Santa and the little girl can't, this can't be a true story. Because the little girl has, you know, has brown eyes, not blue eyes, and, you know, so on and so forth. And then she, she has to explain to them, yeah, that's because it's a stock picture. That's also not my husband, you know. <laughs> and she's had to go in and, and, you know, explain that part of the story. Mm-hmm. And 
And it has really grown. It's been a blessing, an absolute blessing. And I am deeply grateful to, above all, to God for, for bringing this to life. And I'm so humbled that God put this in, in front of me so that, that, that he can really reach out to the people that need to be reached out to and that he can speak to them in a language that they, that they need to hear it in. Well, absolutely. I, I think that this is a, a, a remarkable occurrence. It is nothing short of miraculous in my mind's eye. Um, people uh, these days are hungry for this type of story to be true. And mm-hmm. uh, and with with Mark and Susan here to verify, yes, I realize that people can can unfortunately be cruel and brand them as liars and made it up. But what purpose would they have to make it up? And even if they did, uh, what 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 evil does it enhance? None. It, it only promotes good. Um, right. So the reality is uh, that this is moving forward uh, across social media. Uh, a uh, a platform that I am often very critical of because of its negativity and uh, and uh, all the acrid things that people post there. Uh, I, I will tell you, uh, Lisa, that I was reading through a lot of the uh, comments uh, on your Facebook page where the article is now also posted, where the story is also posted. Um, mm-hmm. And and having if if you read through them, you have various emotions as you read through the thread. Um, and, and you go from uplifted to discouraged, back to uplifted, um, <laughs> as, as, as you see the number of people that uh, that are that are either reaching out there. But there appears to be a lot of uh, a lot of anger underlying a lot of the negative comments that uh, I noted. Mm-hmm. I noted one, a, a couple of them. Uh, one who said, "Well, I guess I didn't pray hard enough." Uh, and another one who said, "You know, you explained to me why you know one girl is healed and my two sons were taken from me." And and don't you wish we could explain those things? Right. Yeah, I do. But you know what? I mean, here's the way I look at that. I I see that, and I can appreciate that. You know, and I and I think I did respond. I think I know which one you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I think I did respond to that one because uh, exactly that. You know, that was the whole thing about why weren't my my two sons and and somebody and somebody had two brothers, and so there's been a few of those like that. Mm-hmm. And I know that I responded, and I and I said, you know, we can all look at it in our own unique way. We all have our own way of wrapping our head around what's going on in our life. And for me, and I, the only thing that I know how to do is share a similar story. When somebody does that, when they say things like that, all I know how to do is share a similar story. And for me, mine is, you know, when I, I mean, I when I grew up, Again, you know, we, I grew up on dirt floors, didn't speak English until I was 10. My mom passed away when I was 8 years old. My dad left when I was 6 months old. And I really didn't have any kind of stability at that early stage of life. When I grew up, moving fast forward, my daughter was abducted from me when she was 5 years old. And I remember the day like it was this morning. I was in the shower, and I dropped to my knees in the shower. The water was running on me. And I know that a lot of people that are posting those things would have been the people that would have dropped and said, maybe, I don't know that for a fact, but they would have dropped and they would have blamed God or gotten angry or lashed out. When I dropped to my knees, I cried, as I'm sure anybody would. But what I cried was I said, God, I don't know what I did so wrong. Have her taken like this. But if you can put it in front of me, show me, give me something, show me what it is, and I promise you I'll fix it. I just need to know what it is. I never blamed him. And five years later, I got a letter. I thought it was junk mail. It was a colorful envelope. And it just, it had my address on it, and that's it. And I literally threw it in the trash, and something inside of me, I like to say it was God, told me, get that out of the trash. That's not junk. And I opened it, and it was literally her dad had written a letter and said, I'm sorry for what I did. If you call any law enforcement agency, if you call anyone, you'll never see her again. And I sent mail back to the address that he left, and I put my number, all my information, and I, I figured we'd follow his little idea of I'm just going to write the letter to put him in contact with me. <laughs> God, 
I got to tell you, I love that shower. I was in the <laughs> shower again, and Jason, who was Sierra's nanny, I have two daughters, um, Sierra's nanny knocked on my bathroom door, and he said, hey, you've got a phone call. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll call back. And he said, no, you want this one. And so Cal wrapped around me barely, not even fully ready to jump out. I get out, I run out, I take the phone call, and it's her dad. And he puts us back in touch, and it was the same that day as it was the day when I had Sierra. I literally got down on my knees, and just as with as much intensity and passion as I did the first time, I could feel it, and I can still feel it through my bones right now. I got down, and I said, I have no idea what I did so right. But if you show me, I swear... I'll keep doing it. I promise you, I'll keep doing it. Please, show me, and I'll keep doing it. And that's one of the biggest driving forces. When I see somebody go negative on something, I sit there and I think, you know, I've been through so much, but I choose, it's a decision, I choose not to blame God because it's not his fault. He doesn't bring these things to us. Everything that is brought to us is for an ultimate purpose. It's for an ultimate design. It's for something bigger than we're ever going to understand. And if we can just keep that in mind and keep praying to God, whether it's bad or good, and say, show me, he will. (laughs) He absolutely will. And I am absolute living proof that he will. He will deliver always, 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 always. And maybe not in the time or the space that we think it should happen, right. but in his own time and space. And that, that comes right back to Mark and Susan. Um, did you ever think, Mark, when this happened to you in 1997 and 8, Susan, when you, when you wrote the story and put it up, uh, you know, nearly you know, 15, 16 years ago, that 15 or 16 years later, suddenly this would be out there in in the way that it is? No, I had no idea, no concept whatsoever of how this would be received or not received. And um, It's just, it's quite frankly, it's been overwhelming to me uh, the, the re- way this has been received and, and the way people have responded to it. Can I say something, Tim? I just really felt glad to say something if I could. And it's something that I have shared to people, thank you, shared with people on Lisa's wall that have responded. And uh, the question you asked about people saying, why did he heal one and not the other? And get so focused in their anger and their lack of understanding. They spend their whole life on this earth as, you know, blaming God and not receiving the gift and this they believe that this is the this life here on earth is the end all and if i could just give i know i'll try to be brief but this is my viewpoint i i believe our time on this earth is but just a grain of sand in all the oceans of the world that's our time on earth is a blink compared to eternity and we pass through this time and place for a season for some the season is short for some, it's longer. And the time we're given here, our individual purpose and our earthly impact is fully known only by one, and that's God Almighty. <clears throat> and everything will be revealed in, uh, to us in heaven. And I believe that when we meet our maker, we're going to see the other side of that tapestry of our lives. And instead of seeing from the earthly side that tapestry, not all threads and a mishmash of color that may re- represent only pain or suffering or just or doubt or grief, we're going to see the other side from heaven, and we're going to see this beautiful entire picture, and we will understand everything. And in the meantime, you know, God's Word clearly tells us that we are spiritual beings designed to reside in the flesh, in this place, for a time. And, you know, we're to praise and glorify God. Number one, He tells us that's our purpose, and then second, lead others to to His Son. And... You know, why did he, did he heal some and not mine? I, I will say that it became clear to me only a few months ago when I lost my precious 
only brother who was, young, was younger than 14 months younger than me to a long sickness and disease. But sometimes people get their healing on earth, like little Sarah, and sometimes they get their healing in heaven. When they get their new body in Christ, my brother is free from sickness, from disease, from pain, from suffering, and he's got his new body, and he is healed in heaven. And sometimes that happens there. After this blink that we're on this earth, compared to eternity, he got his in heaven. And, you know, we're, we have the promise as Christians of being reunited for all eternity with the Lord, with the ones that have gone on before us. But if we as humans could see now, here in this earth, that our time is short and we should be working to get it, our will fulfilled and make every minute count and long to spend eternity in paradise with, with the others, you know, I think that would be absolutely wonderful and I feel like that's my purpose in this whole story. And I know that my brother who has seen heaven would never want to come back to this place of sin and suffering. No way. He's probably grieving up there that we're having to live here and saying, hurry up and get here. Let that blink, you know, happen pretty quick because I miss you and you're going to be so blessed up here. But, you know, this time is temporal and don't spend it suffering and questioning. Um, you know, we have a way to, um, to be... Reunited, reunited with those we love and with God forever. And we have a plan only that we can fulfill in God's own time on this earth. And He uses all of us as ordinary and as flawed as we are. Um, we just have to look for it. Like Mark said this morning, you know, we should be expecting miracles every day. If we, right. if we, you know, if we as Christians live in the Spirit, we should expect, we should expect miracles every single day. I would agree. And uh, our, our time is growing desperately short, uh, everyone. Uh, I know, Lisa, you would agree that uh, you know, miracles are a, are a matter of, of, of choice and perspective to a degree. You can see miracle or you can see coincidence. Uh, you, can, mm-hmm. you, you can choose to believe or you can be uh, you know, confronted with evidence that you want to argue against. Um, but the reality is you, you, you've, you've got little to lose by grasping onto the hope that is presented through stories like the one that we've shared today. You know, it's kind of funny. My ex-husband, he always says, you know, because when we first met, he didn't believe in God. And the more uh, he's been around me, and we've we've been divorced for quite a number of years, but we're still very good friends. And he, he at one point got to where he started saying, you know, I think I'd rather believe in God. <laughs> I think I'd rather believe in God and be wrong than not believe in God and be wrong. <laughs> and it, it's so really quite simple. That, but one, yeah, it is. And yeah, I'm really moved to say this. I don't. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I really feel moved to say this. And this is. I know a lot of people probably think that you know this is a good opportunity to to address the atheists and address the agnostics and the non-believers. But I'm going to put this out to the Christians. We're here to love. We're not here to judge. That is so not our job. It. It because I guarantee you if. If we do that, we're going to be judged more harshly. And so I, I really, you know, I, I, I'm human. I'm not perfect. I struggle with it, too. I do everything I can to remember to love and not judge, love and not judge, and to remember that we're here. We're not as a museum to surround ourselves with the righteous. We're supposed to be a hospital to serve the broken, to serve God's word to the broken, because he does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And no matter what you've done, no matter what is out there, what you think is so awful, it's not. Because God is a forgiving, loving God, and there is nothing that is too wrong that he can't fix it. He's already forgiven it. He's already let it go. And I've started to live by, and I've been doing this since the day that my daughter was returned to me. I started living by the principle that when somebody says I'm sorry for doing something to me, my initial response right out of my mouth, and now it's become a part of my nature, and it does take practice. When someone says I'm sorry for something, I say, oh, please, I forgave you before it was even over, before we, before we got this far. I've already forgiven you. I've, I don't even know what you're talking about. I've already forgotten about it. That is the and if we can, that is the, that is if the we can place we need to, to be. By that, Yes, it is. Absolutely. Dr. Lisa, Susan, and Mark, I, I can't thank you. We're, we're at the top of the hour, and unfortunately that waits for no one around here. 
But uh, thank you for the inspiring story, the inspiring testimony. And, uh, you know, my greatest hope is that uh, we've given some people a little bit of hope in this Christmas season. Merry Christmas to all of you. Merry Christmas, and oh. thank you for having us. Merry, thank you. Merry, Merry Christmas, and God bless. And, Susan, your voice is beautiful. I love you. You're amazing. <laughs> and I think it's just a miracle that we were put together, and I think it's just wonderful what your husband has done. And Merry Christmas to you all. We will uh, be back with Ag Matters after the top of the hour on WCLO, Janesville, Beloit. This is the season for giving and helping your neighbors. We at E&D Waterworks would like to help you. For every water heater, softener, or iron filter sold from now until Christmas, in your name, we will make a $20 donation to either Echo or the Salvation Army. Don't put off your decision to get a new energy-efficient water heater or save salt and wastewater with Logic's Demand Regeneration Water Conditioner today. Call 752-4718 or go to edwaterworks.com for details. E&D Waterworks wishes happy holidays to you. If water runs to it or through it, we do it. Hey guys, if you're into fantasy football, you've got to check out FanDuel.com. At FanDuel, you play in one-week fantasy football leagues for real money with immediate cash payouts. You only play when you want, and you can change your team any week. FanDuel is paying out over $75 million a week this season. Plus, right now, FanDuel is giving you a bonus of up to $200 that gets earned as you play. For every dollar you deposit, FanDuel will match it up to 200 bucks. Go to FanDuel.com and enter the promo code TOUCHDOWN2015. That's FanDuel.com, promo code TOUCHDOWN2015.